On the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he took the cup. When Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper, what did he say and what did he do and what blessings did he intend for us? And that's our study today, the Lord's Supper. I'm Pastor Ken Larson with Trinity Lutheran Church in Delray Beach. As always, I invite you to attend in person if you want, with all of the carefulness of masks and social distancing at either 8.30 or 10.30. We're located at 400 North Swinton in Delray Beach. I also invite you now to this Bible study where we are studying something that you need never and I hope never take for granted. Indeed. What does the Bible say about the Lord's Supper? That's our study this morning. And we have several people that are a gathering with us to study. Evelyn and Dee and Pat and Pastor Clem and Bobby is with us. Uh, and Judy and, and Joanne and Evelyn. I think I named everyone. I don't usually do that. The Lord's Supper on the night in which he was betrayed. That is a significant item in the list of particulars having to do with the Lord's Supper. Jesus was doing something, giving to those apostles and also through them to the whole church, the Lord's Supper. The Da Vinci painting is so famous, you see it in many homes and in many churches. Your questions, however, about the Lord's Supper, I'm going to pause. And before I ask you any questions, I'm going to ask you, and I'll write down if you have anything that you'd like to ask, anything at all about the Lord's Supper. Give it some thought. Do you have any questions about the Lord's Supper? It actually, it actually happened on what we call Maundy Thursday. That's right. Okay. The Sabbath began uh, at the end of the day. The Jewish people count the beginning of the day, <clears throat> depending on who you read, either when the first star appears in the night sky or when three stars appear in the night sky. That is the beginning of the next day. Okay. Okay, so this was what we call Maundy Thursday. And I have a question for you. Do you know why it's Maundy? M-A-U-N-D-Y. Maundy. No. no. Anybody have a, a clue? It's not in Matthew and Mark and Luke. It's in the Gospel of John. The day of the Lord. The day the of the Lord. Well, that's not the answer I'm looking for. Okay. What does Maundy mean? Mandatum. Mandatum, right. And that's Latin. Will you, will you, can, you, can anyone translate what mandatum is? Uh, the day of the commandment. It is. The day of the commandments. Now, we have the English word mandate which means uh, a command given to, to, what should we say, a political figure after having been elected by a large majority. I have a mandate. But a mandate in the legal sense is a command. Okay. So it was Monday Thursday, but why is it? <laughs> we haven't answered the question. Why is it mandatum? What was the command? I said it's not in Matthew and Mark and Luke. It is in the Gospel of John when he took a, a towel and washed their the feet. feet. And then he wanted them to be servants of each other as he was a servant to them. They were arguing about who would be the greatest. <laughs> Jesus, their master, is going to be betrayed into the hands of sinful men uh, and on the next day be crucified. 
and they want to know who's going to sit at his right hand and the left. Oh, dear. So he gave them a commandment that they should do as he had done to be servants of one another. And the major part of the command was love one another as I have loved you. That is the new commandment I give unto you. So it's called Maundy Thursday, not after the Lord's Supper, which in a way is commanded and, and given, but what he gave them on that night. An interesting mm. connection between love and the Lord's Supper, huh? Yeah. Okay, now you know something you didn't have with you when you came mm. this morning. That's pretty good. Other questions about the Lord's Supper? Good. Now listen, uh, as we go along in the study today, uh, questions come up. Don't hesitate to just jump in and say, I have a question. All right. The Lord's Supper. We're going to talk about Jesus' institution of it. That means his beginning of it, giving of the supper. And the occasion, which we started to talk about last time, and the words that he spoke and the actions that he did and what was his intent? What did he want to happen? And the value and blessing for us, uh, plural on the blessing. And then if we have time, the proper reception. We never get to everything. <laughs> That's good but, though. But, well, I want us to have a thorough study. I don't want it to be um, just glossing over, Evelyn, and that's, I, I thank you for recognizing that. The Lord's Supper. Well, this is another painting, how it might have looked, although they were reclining at table. It was common in those days to eat what we would say on the floor, on towels or blankets or cloth that had been spread on the floor. And that also would comprise the table if they had none. But they would rest if they were right-handed on their left on their left elbow uh, and eat with their right, if they're right-handed. So this is the celebration of the Passover with the blood that Moses had told the people because God told him, smear the blood of the lamb on the doorpost and the, the lintel, the top part. And uh, when the angel of death comes, he will pass over you and not kill the firstborn as he will kill the firstborn of all of the Egyptians. I want, um, Judy usually leads off from Exodus 12, 14. Uh, this day shall be for... This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations, as a statue forever. You shall keep it as a feast. So this was an option. This was not an option. This was a regular day to keep every year. The first month in the Jewish year is Nisan, Nisan. N-I-S-A-N. -S and it was on the 14th day of that month that they would have this feast, this memorial day. All right. Uh, was that each month or just once a year? Once a year. Once a year in the Jewish calendar like this. That was the start of the new year for the Jewish? That's right. Okay. The first month of their year. Now, because their months only had 28 days, uh, keeping it in phase with the moon, that meant that actually they could have 13 months in a typical year. And it still doesn't quite make it. So some months had to have more days. I cannot figure that out. If you <laughs> see a Jewish calendar, you might be able to see how they did it. Because 13 times 28 doesn't make 365 and a quarter. <laughs> so the astronomers and the religious people had a constant tension. I want you to remember that the sacrificial lamb in the Passover supper 
pointed to the Messiah who would come. And when John said, Behold the Lamb of God, he was pointing to Jesus. That's John the Baptist, of course. And he knew, because of the Lord's revelation, that this was the Lamb of God who would be slain to take away the sin of the world. Now, when the Apostle John wrote this gospel, it all had taken place according to the Lord's word. So when, when he records this, John the Apostle also knows the completion of the story. Jesus is the Lamb of God. And Jesus is going to celebrate the Passover with these apostles. And he will connect the feast that he is beginning uh, with the feast that was proclaimed and celebrated every year. Now, of course, there were years uh, in the past 1,400 years when they did not, the Jewish people did not, for various reasons, celebrate the Passover. But that's another story. Jesus prepared his disciples to prepare the supper. Another reader, please. And we're still in the Gospel of uh, Mark, I believe, chap uh, chapter 14, verses 12 through 16, right? Yeah. Who's up, Evelyn? And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, go into the city and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you, follow him. Whenever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. The gospel writer Luke tells us these two disciples were Peter and John. <clears throat> and you'll remember that throughout the gospels, it is often Peter, James, and John who are associated with important events. They seem to be closer to Jesus, uh, that they do more for him. They are present with him at significant events, uh, primarily the transfiguration. And, and what's the other one? When Jesus prays in the garden. He takes with him Peter, James, and John. The gospel writers never tell us why those three, but it is prominent. So he tells two of them to go and prepare the Passover supper. If we read the gospels a little more carefully, we'll find out that Jesus was not in Jerusalem for the previous two Passovers. He, for one of them, he was in Galilee. Another one, he was traveling. Hmm. And I can't tell you why he didn't seek to be in the city, which was where the, uh, the people gathered for those three feasts. And pr primarily now we're speaking of the Passover feast. Um can't answer the why. We aren't told. Or it is also possible that he went down for the, those Passovers. The important point here, though, is that he was there for this Passover, the one before Good Friday, the right. one before the, they crucified him. So we're talking about the occasion. When you on any given occasion, go to worship and receive the Lord's Supper. I think it is important for all of us to remember how it was prepared in the first place and what it means. This is not just going through the motions. I hope it will never be for you 
going through the motions. Jesus prepared his apostles to eat the Passover. Uh, D, would you read? Luke 22, 14 to 15, Jesus prepared his apostles to eat the Passover. And when the hour came, he reclined at table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Well, that's the occasion. And Jesus has words that he speaks with which we are very familiar because we hear them every time that we celebrate and receive communion and then his actions. And we're familiar with those two. Jesus took bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. That's from Luke twenty two nineteen. He gave us the Lord's supper. His words and actions are vitally important. Without Jesus' word and the actions that he gave, there is no Lord's Supper. This is not the invention of people in the church. We did not decide, let's have wine and let's have uh, uh, bread and let's celebrate in remembrance of him. This was Jesus' action, words, and command from Luke 22, 20. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Hmm. The Lord's Supper has actions. We can name the actions that Jesus did. He took the bread. What kind of bread was it? Unleavened. 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 Do you know why it was unleavened? Because they could keep it longer on their trip. They could. But what did God command Moses to command the people when they were about to escape? Yes, they were going to travel. They were about to escape. And they were going to, on the 14th day of Nisan, take the bread and eat it. They well, would did, not. Did they, did they eat up all the bread that had yeast in it so they no longer had any yeast to make leavened bread? The yeast um, was not to be in the house. Not a particle of yeast no. should be uh, in the, and, and the yeast. Passover. Right. And the yeast came to represent the, the, the meant uh, the sin. Right. It creeps into the into your life and creeps into the corners of your cupboards. Of, and it doesn't well. take much to make the bread rise, does it? No. All right. I, I don't bake bread. It's an art and a science. They didn't have time to have the bread raise. Right. There was not time to wait for the bread to raise and to knead it and then to let it rise again at the proper temperature. That's the critical thing, isn't it? Right. You, everybody, anybody here make bread anymore? Not anymore, no. not in the past. Yeah. Bankers. <laughs> <laughs> Too many we can, calories. <laughs> we can go to Publix and buy the bread or uh, just in a sack and it's, uh, it's ready to Put on the top of the stove. We used to put it near the uh, pilot light. Mm -hmm. Now there's a setting on the oven <laughs> just for that purpose. That's true. Well, it was unleavened bread. And then he gave thanks and he broke it. Why did he break the bread? Careful. Why did Jesus break the bread? Would it represent, because it represented his body, which was going to be broken. Oh, Judy, we have to take, we have to take you outside and um, <laughs> no, do, do not please ever use the, don't use the word represent because. Okay, Jesus, okay that's wrong. It, it, it is. Okay. But why did he break it? He's got, he's got a thin 
oh, circle, let's say, of the bread which has been baked over fire. Why did he break it? So everybody could have some? Yes, so he could distribute it. It did not point to the breaking of Jesus' body. And now many people say that, but you'll remember that in the Old Testament was prophesied that not a bone of his body should be broken. <laughs> Jesus was not broken, and neither does the breaking of the bread point to the breaking of Jesus' body. Often, when we do something often, we often when we do something often, we attach meanings that our minds uh, uh, come up with because we always have to have reasons. And when we can't find one, unfortunately, we'd like to make some up. Well, that won't do here. We have Jesus' words and actions. He broke it in order to distribute it, simple as that, and he gave it to his disciples. Now, when the, apostle, when the apostles are gathered, they are called the Twelve. And that's how we know that Judas is there, along with the fact that um, Jesus pointed to him. I'm not going to study that with you today. It's another subject. But he gave it to the disciples who happened to be the 12 disciples called apostles. In the narrative, they are constantly called the disciples, which is true. Remember, all the apostles are disciples, but not all the, apostles, the disciples are apostles. Got that? And then he took the cup, and what did he do with the cup? He gave it to the disciples. What was in the cup? Wine. It was wine. And the reason we know it was wine and not grape juice, what is the reason we know it was fermented? I discussed this with you. If you don't believe in drinking, if you believe drinking is against God's law, you have great problems with this. And so you manufacture uh, grape juice, which has not, been allowed to ferment well i'll give a reason maybe i'll be standing in the corner again here that's all right <laughs> uh, uh, yes. you learn sometimes more by making a mistake and you didn't mean represent when you realized you after you pointed it out yes and and also broken because i knew his bones were not broken okay. um because wine was the common um the common uh drink yeah. that they had with their meals ordinarily from what i understand why could it not have been unfermented what month what month is nissan or what two months could it have been march and april march and april that's correct okay uh, uh when were the wine when were the grapes harvested in the in the fall what happens with the wine in the wineskin between the fall and march and april <laughs> it ferments yes and <laughs> i don't much. know how much i'm not a winemaker i don't know how long it takes it's a chemical process and partly a physical process and those people who are experts they know the time and temperature very well that is an art. Mm -hmm. I have yeah. a good, good friend in Missouri who goes out to the vineyards and uh, often he is allowed to sample the wine, but then uh, not so much anymore. He used to do that. Anyway, it's fermented. That's all I wanted to point out, that the cup contained wine. And I can't tell you what strength, what was the percentage. It was also very common in the celebration of the supper to dilute it with water. Huh? Yes. And I could make up reasons, but I don't have them. I would have to consult a rabbi or some of the writings in the Talmud and the other writings to find out why the water. 
talking about. I haven't researched that. To us, it doesn't matter. If you ever went to a Lutheran church and you found the wine weak, then you said, well, did they have too little so that they diluted it? Or were they following the custom of the rabbis? I don't know. I have never, in my knowledge, gone to communion and received uh, watered-down wine. Uh, so, uh, have you? No. Okay. No. It doesn't matter what brand. It, it doesn't matter what strength. I do understand from reading that the chemical process for wine, which presents itself eventually with an alcohol percentage, that the chemical reaction is self-limiting. And uh, until uh, it will continue to ferment, I understand until it was has reached maybe 12 to 14% alcohol by weight or by volume. And then, it, and then the reaction stops. You'll have to consult your chemistry book to find out why that's true. I think, can't it turn into almost vinegar sometimes, something? That, uh, yes, vinegar? it can. Mm -hmm. And that has happened in my take communion to sick and shut in wine in the bottle. I could tell you a story, but it would slow it down. <laughs> but maybe, <laughs> maybe they diluted it because they could drink longer be, without getting drunk. I mean, you know. And there were four cups of wine in the Passover supper. I read recently that they were to drink the entire cup. They being a, a thing called a company. The company is a family or more than one family gathered together. And the rule was you had to gather enough together so that there would be no particle of the lamb left over. That is all the consumable portions of the lamb would be eaten. Yeah, we read that last, or I think last week we covered that in the Passover when they had to prepare the lamb, that it all had to right. be eaten. So with Jesus and the 12, that constituted enough uh, present to receive the entire lamb. Now it's interesting to me, and I can't tell you why, that the gospel writers do not mention the eating of the lamb it uh the narrative does say that they they prepared it but the word roasting is not there mm -hmm. that was the command that moses gave that it was to be roasted and not boiled or baked it has to be roasted what did jesus say we know very well um, another reader, please, from Luke twenty-two nineteen. I can do that. Okay, Joy. What did Jesus say? And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Luke twenty-two nineteen. He said, This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. Now, this remembrance is not left out by us Lutheran Christians, but it's not the only thing. It's also the remembrance that Jesus gave his body with the bread. Mm -hmm. We're going to study that in more detail soon. And then read, please, Joanne, from Luke 22. 20. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he, uh, oh, sorry. Read the second. This cup that is poured for you is the new covenant in my blood. All right. And then but he finally, didn't really tell him what the new covenant Yes, he did. The old okay. covenant. The old covenant was the covenant of the law, and the new covenant had a connection with the shedding of blood, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. 
Now, Joanne, would you finish up with, uh, did you have a question first? I was just going to say, in the old covenant represented the sacrifice of an actual lamb, and the new covenant represented Christ's sacrifice, did it not? It points to the, the sacrificial lamb in the Old Testament pointed to the sacrifice which would happen. Yes. And then I'll say again, as I often say, that with God there is no time. And so they are one and the same. The sacrifices of the Old Testament, the animal sacrifices, did not in of themselves do anything. Mm -hmm. But it gave to the people that pointer to the Christ who would come and shed his blood. Okay. It is hard for us to see how they could see that because we're not back there being deprived of all the New Testament passages. Uh, Joanne, would you finish up the last one? Drink of it. Drink of it, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for the many for the forgiveness of sin. And there you have the forgiveness promise. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now here's the question which has divided Christendom for, well, what should we say, five centuries. Does Jesus give us his body and blood in this supper? This slide is empty except for the question. So that means I'm presenting that question to you. I say yes. You say yes because he said, this is my body. We're going to do that again. Yes. He, took, he took bread and gave it to them. This is my body. When the Holy Spirit inspired and gave to the gospel writers what words they should use, he used the word is, and the word is is like an equal sign. It connects, if you want to stay with the grammar, the subject and the predicate. And you remember that maybe from your grammar studies in the fourth and fifth and sixth grades, that when you have a predicate and a subject joined by the a word of being, such as is or are, that there's an equation. This, what yeah. was this? The bread. Right. This is my body. Do not try to figure out how this can be. I raise the caution flag because that's what our rational minds do at this point. And because many in the last five centuries have used their rational minds to try to figure out how this can be, well, I would say go to Mary when the angel visits her and says that which is conceived in you is of the Holy Spirit. He is, the uh, Gabriel is not specifically answering Mary's question. How can this be since I have not known a man? There is no way I could be conceiving. And the answer was, this is of the Holy Spirit. Those are just mysteries we have to under, uh, we have to just accept through faith. By faith. And we accept them because Jesus gives them to us. And in the giving of these words, he creates that faith, which is able to receive, which the rational mind would reject. Correct. But that's also true of his dying on the cross for the forgiveness of sins. The rational mind says, there's no way that something that happened 2,000 years ago can have anything to do with taking away the wrong that I have done today. Yes, yes it, it does. And only faith can receive that. Mm -hmm. All the things that Moses gave to the people that he received from God are not to be received by the mind, but by the heart. 
And God himself prepares our hearts through the Holy Spirit to receive that which the mind will say it cannot be. Take eat, this is my body. Matthew 26, 26. The words are plain and simple. He took the cup and he said, this is my blood. It looks like wine. It has the aroma, aroma of, my, of wine. It tastes like wine. And anyone there would say, it is wine. Jesus said, this is my blood. Again, the rational mind says, uh, this is not... This is not going in well. I'm not speaking to your rational mind, says Jesus. I am speaking to your heart, which can receive this by faith. Jesus' word, or if you'd like to say his words, spoken then, makes his body and blood present and received in this supper. Now I'm going to say something that won't be clear now, but I will clear it up in a few slides. It is received by all who come, whether they are believing or not believing. Mm. That's a critical point in the proper reception. But right now, I just want to say that it is not my faith or your faith that makes the body and blood of Jesus present. It is also not the words of the pastor that make them present. Did you ever think that that was so? It is the word of Jesus spoken then. Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. That was 2,000 years ago almost. How can that have anything to do with what is happening now on the altar? Well, it does. Because a mere man cannot, by speaking Jesus' words, make anything happen. The miracle takes place when Jesus spoke those words. And he's the only one with the power to do so. Now, that's a fine point that you may not have ever heard before. I was trained at the seminary when we were shown how to, and we practiced how to do the Lord's Supper. I was told to make the sign of the cross over the bread and over the wine. And I still do so, as most pastors do. But you know what? I'm always afraid that people will think that my making the sign of the cross is what makes the bread body and makes the wine blood. It is not the sign of the cross. That's the sign of consecration, which is a human word that says, I am setting aside these earthly elements in order to use them properly in the supper that Jesus commanded and gave. Oh, by the way, Jesus commands it, but the Lord's Supper is 100% gospel. Could you use this bread and wine without consecrating it and, and have it mean the same thing? The Just by saying Jesus' words? We consecrate a new church as tomorrow the people up at Grace Lutheran Church in Port St. Lucie will, after two years of planning and construction and financing, will consecrate this new building and set it aside, those are the words, set it aside for God's purposes. Mm. They will have a ceremony of consecration. They're not going to call it dedication. When we have a consecration of the wine and the bread. It is to tell the people, 
that are about to receive that this is what we are doing. Nothing magic takes place uh, in the consecration. And now you asked a slightly different question. You said, could you, could you do the supper without the consecration? Yes. I would yep. never celebrate the Lord's Supper without using Jesus' explicit words. It would just be like a, a play. It would be, um, let's have um, wine, Blas wine and cheese, but I don't have any cheese. Right. Would it be blasphemy if it was done by somebody on, I guess, on purpose with that intent? Uh, try to ask your question a little bit more finer so I can understand what you're getting to. Okay. Uh, I guess if, if, if somebody just uh, whimsically uh, took wine and bread and uh, gave it to a bunch of people saying it was the Lord's Supper, but really within their heart didn't have the faith, uh, or they had the faith, but they just did it with the intent to, uh, I guess, with blasphemy or um, yeah, against the Lord. Yeah, I wouldn't do that. And I don't know if anybody would, they might, Unless, uh, yeah. in, in mocking. Yeah, in mocking or you know, uh, well, people, I mean, people, for many reasons, you know, walk away from the church for who knows why. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, the word, I don't like to use the word hate, but hate and anger enter into it. And, uh, yeah, well, let's, let's stay with the supper. Without the consecration, without the words of Jesus, now, now here we have a conundrum, a, a, a mystery, a, a, a riddle, something that I cannot explain. You just heard me say that it is Jesus' words and not mine that make it the supper. Well, then why would I need to say anything? And the answer is, I say it for the instruction of the people. I say it because this is his command, to do this in remembrance of him. And what is this? The this is the whole action. And that's why I listed what Jesus did here. I would do, where is it? I would do all these things. I would take unleavened bread and I would give thanks and I would break it and I would give it to the people. Now, we don't have to break it because it comes to us conveniently in wafers. But if I had unleavened bread and, and, and baked it, I would have to break it and give it to each communicant. All right. So I would give the bread and then I would take the cup and give that to the communicants. I would do the same actions and use Jesus' words because I am not only doing what Jesus said and did, I am also following his command. Does that begin to answer your question, Judy? Um, yeah, it, to some degree, yes. I wouldn't do it um, out of mere habit. Okay, so it's his word that makes it present. And this is his word. This is my body. This is my blood. Now, here's the, here's the question that no one should ever try to answer. So I gave it away, didn't I? How does this take place? It's a mystery. It's unsolved. It's unsolvable. Never ever try to figure it out. It is a nature of faith that to figure out what is, which is given to you to believe destroys that which is what you're heart is trying to take hold of. If you could explain how God created the heavens and the earth with his word. <laughs> you see, the first mystery is Genesis 1. And it's presented to us as fact, not contrary to science. No. But it's the first mystery. Did you ever think of that? And the mysteries continue. Every time that uh, there's a miracle, 
Well, you're not going to figure out how it happens that Jesus feeds the 5,000 with a few fish and a little bit of bread and has leftovers. You're not going to figure that out. And you don't try to. So why would you try to figure out how this can be? All right. What do we receive when we receive the Lord's Supper? Forgiveness of sins. Yes. His but body I'll, and his blood. We receive his body and his blood. Anything else? The remembrance of the new covenant. Yes. Right. This is not the fifteen seconds of um, Jeopardy. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've had almost a whole minute here for you to answer the question. We're not done yet. What else do we receive? You're going, to start, you're going to start making up answers now. They don't want to join me in the corner. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't want, Judy, I don't want you to ever feel bad about my I, question. Do you know I, when I... I taught in the upper room, I mean in the conference room in the minister center, I I was often very direct when someone said something that was contrary to scripture. And I'm I, only kidding. I'm only kidding. <laughs> this is the way I teach adults. I would not do that if teaching children. I wouldn't be that direct. I, I open my mouth and put put it, uh, or I open my uh, mouth and put my foot in it frequently. So. <laughs> I, I, I do the same. And it's usually Jeannie that corrects me or tells me I shouldn't have opened my mouth. But back to the subject. What do we receive? Go ahead. Tell me. Tell us all. Well, does our faith increase every time we uh, we take the Lord's Supper? Uh, I don't know. Does it? <laughs> when Whenever the right gospel is presented, it is presented to our faith to take hold of and yes, to increase our faith. We receive, I want to say life. We feel like we receive life uh, in receiving Christ's body because we no. know he lived. You're, you're quoting Luther without knowing it. Okay. Because where there is forgiveness of sins, there is also life, life and salvation. And salvation, yeah. You're, maybe you remember that from your catechism. I want to do the catechism when we get done with the study of scripture. Oh my gosh. Not today. Be All right, time. let's... Uh, uh, I didn't put the answers on the slide. We also receive, ready, bread and wine. Oh. Now, when I'm teaching this, I put on the board that Lutherans uh, have something special. The Roman Catholic people believe that they do not receive bread and wine, but only the bread, only the body and blood. Okay, I'm not going to go into their theories or their teaching. I'm just going to say that the Roman Catholics do not receive, I mean, according to their official teaching, the bread and wine. Now, if you go to the other side of the fence, the people uh, of the uh, who descended from Zwingli and Calvin, they believe that they receive only bread and wine but not the true body and blood of Jesus. Now, many of their people, if you ask them, will tell you, no, I received the body and blood of Jesus. But the official teaching, and it depends on where you went to seminary and how strong the teaching was, so it's not uniform as it is uniform in the Catholic Church for their, for their teaching. But they receive, according to the official teaching, the people of the I'm just going to say the Reformed branch. And that includes most of the evangelicals as far as their official teaching. 
But then again, the evangelicals don't have any official teaching. <laughs> they don't have a book of Concord. They don't have, uh, well, they had a catechism a long time ago. All right. Your time is up already? No, no, that was just a, just a text message. So let me finish this. We receive the bread and the wine, and we see, receive the body and blood of Jesus. Okay. So why do we call the Supper Communion? It's a gathering. You have any, well, wait a minute, I've got to, I've got to stop here. I've got to ask you, do you have any questions about this reception? Maybe you don't yet. Okay. Now, why do we call it communion? Where it's is that? Gathering of, of saints. Uh huh. Because we do it in community. Yeah. But why in the scriptures do we call it communion? We're in communion with our Lord. Can you give me a scripture passage that says something like that? Well, I'm going to give you one. The word communion comes from Paul's first letter to the Corinthians. I should say first letter. In 1 Corinthians 10, 16. Would you read it, please? Who is next? Who hasn't read? I'll, I'll quick read it here. Uh, the cup of blessing, which was uh, blessed... Is it not the communion of the blood of Christ, the bread which we break? Is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Now, that's according to the King James uh, translation of the Bible. And you can take the word communion and go back in the Greek and find out where it comes from. So other people that translate the New Testament have translated it as sharing of the blood of Christ and sharing of the body of Christ. And fellowship, less common. Uh, more common, however, is the word participation. The cup of blessing which we bless, it is, is it not the participation of the blood of Christ? The bread which we break, is it not the participation of the body of Christ? The Greek word is koinonia, which you have heard before, I believe, and it means sharing or having things in common. So when we have this cup, which contains wine and also is a participation in Christ's blood and the bread which we break and also eat, of course, it is a participation in Christ's body. Now there's a mystery there that nobody, not even St. Paul, uh, tries to explain. He just says it is. And the reason he is saying this, I'll give you a brief background, is that people were going to the altar of false gods. And they were going to the altar where sinful things had taken place. And St. Paul compares this to if you lie with a prostitute, are you not uh, participating in that kind of an altar and have that in common, which you should only have in common with your wife? So why would I eat the bread offered to idols? I'm making a jump there, but you wouldn't want to have that participation in things that were false and untrue and unholy. So when you go to the Lord's Supper and you receive the blood of Christ and the body of Christ, it is a participation in something which is commanded and which is holy and which is right and according to the Lord's intent. I hope I have summed that up accurately. I don't think I've ever tried to explain. But if you read 1 Corinthians 10, the whole chapter, 
That's homework. <laughs> uh, you'll get the flavor, which I'm trying to explain when, in this summary. No, maybe I shouldn't have tried to do that. But there it is. This is the Lord's Supper. And I'm going to end with this one more question, but I won't have time to uh, cover it fully. And that's this question, which we kind of hinted at a little bit a few minutes ago. And this is the question. Are the bread and the wine changed into the body and blood of Christ? This is a place where it would be possible for you to be uh, corrected. Now, I know Judy had to leave early today, so she's excused. Well, they can't be changed if they already are. That's a good answer. Right. Because the word is Jesus' word. Right. There's no changing necessary. If you're a Roman Catholic, you might believe in some type of change. And various words have been given to that, such as transubstantiation. And that means, freely translated, and I'm not good at Latin, but it means that the substance, transubstantiation, has been changed. Transubstantiation. Lutherans do not teach or believe in transubstantiation. In fact, we don't use any word to talk about it. The best that Martin Luther could come up with is to use three prepositions, three pep prepositions, and that we receive the body and blood of Christ in, with, and under the bread and the wine. And he used three prepositions in order to say, we really don't know how this takes place, but we do receive it in a way that only Christ could give it. So they are not changed. There's no change in the physical characteristics of the bread and wine. You can taste the bread, although it doesn't have much taste, does it? Yeah. It's just wheat and you can taste the wine can't you you do and there might be a, a very uh, delicate aroma depending on what kind of wine is being used by the way it doesn't matter what kind of wine that we use i always use mogan david and I used to joke, well, of course we use Mogan David because it's kosher. Uh, I was at another church where they insisted on having Manischewitz. But there's no command. Some congregations order wine from a monastery. They order it by the case. If you look in the sacristy at Trinity Lutheran, I think you will find a case or two or three of Mogan David. Okay. It's a sweet wine. It goes down easily. It doesn't catch in the throat as dry wines will for some people. People who don't ordinarily drink wine might have a trouble uh, when it touches the back of the palate. But the sweet wine, uh, like Mogan David, um, goes down almost as easily as Welch's grape juice. Has that been your experience? No. There's been no trouble? Okay, good. Well, there's a, a good place for us to stop today. And uh, according to my timekeeping, we're right at 60 minutes. Oh, wow. Lord God, uh, bring us together at the altar to receive your body and blood with the bread and the wine and cause this sacrament to bring to us that which you put into it, the forgiveness of sins and life and salvation reminding us 
of the sacrifice that you made long ago, which is still effective in our lives today. Bring us to the table that you prepare with repentant hearts, endeavoring to amend our sinful life and to follow you wherever you lead. We ask it in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.